Well, hello there again. It's Barbara Ann Foley, Council on Aging Director, and I have with me today our two friends, Greg Durrett from Future Secured Financial and Rich Scarano uh, from Holgram, <coughs> Koritz, and Scarano Law Offices. And we are going to talk about our second part um, series in our uh, financial world as well as our legal world melding together. And it's going to be on long-term care. We do have lots of people who come to our outreach offices and um, even myself individually and ask questions about um, nursing homes and trusts and annuities and legal people and when do I need a lawyer and all of that kind of um, stuff. So I thought by having both of these gentlemen it would be helpful to get some questions answered from the right people instead of having to refer directly on the phone. Um, and they have the answers. So to insure or not to insure, it sounds like that is the question. Um, and I know you guys have the answers. May I start? Because I only sure. learned one thing in law school. The correct answer to most questions is it depends. <laughs> okay. With that, it's great. I concur. <laughs> well, it, th there is a question. And I, you know what? Um, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I was in um, Mashpee. A friend of mine and uh, client is a... Uh, He's part of the Knights of Columbus, and he was running a blood drive. And said, would you give blood? I said, sure. And I went down and um, sat at a table with all these gentlemen eating the cookies afterwards and whatnot, you know, uh, to try to recover. And I said, oh, what do you do? And, uh, and by the way, should I get long-term care insurance? And like Rich said, the answer was, it depends. It depends. <laughs> right? And there are a couple of different considerations. The primary consideration is do you have assets that need protecting? Because if we're going to just go straight to Medicaid or you don't have enough to really consider doing insurance, and there are a couple of types of insurance, then it really doesn't serve you to allocate any of those assets to that expense. On the other hand, if you do have assets that need protecting, one of the things that the government of many, many states started in 1993, believe it or not, is a thing called the Partnership Program. Now the Partnership Program is, is not all that well known, but what it does is it's an incentive by the government to try to encourage people to go out and buy their own private long-term care insurance. And the way they do that is they say, okay, if you can purchase a qualifying type of long-term care product, and again, I'm not gonna get into the weeds on that because there's a bunch of different nuances. You get a qualifying long-term care product in many states, and I'll tell you the difference in Massachusetts here in a second, but in many states what it does is it says, okay, you bought X amount of monthly benefit and that translates into, let's say, $500,000 over your lifetime. And so that's your total lifetime benefit. Well, that amount of money then becomes excluded as an asset. So in other words, if you had $600,000 of assets and you decided you needed to go to a nursing home, you would be able to have 502,000, because the 2,000 is the Medicaid number. Right. The 500,000 would be the amount that was in the insurance. You could spend down just $98,000 and take that $502,000 of cash that you have in your pocket and keep it in your pocket. And the, the state won't seek recovery on that. Now Massachusetts actually enhanced that a little bit and said, okay, you know what? We're gonna exclude your house from recovery as that expense asset that we need to recover. So there, there are a bunch of states that do this. Where it gets complicated is when we have people, you know, around here we have a lot of people that move south and they go to Florida and whatnot. Whatever state you go to, you first have to know if you've gone through this partnership thing <coughs> Excuse me. and you've gone and purchased that with that in mind as a protection, the state that you go to, does it participate in the program? Secondarily, does it have the same rules? And third, is there reciprocity? And so you have to have all three of those things in, in and in mind when you're deciding on where you want to go if that, in fact, was something that you wanted to do. Uh, Rich said, well, this is going to put a lot of lawyers out of business. It actually doesn't. Like I say, it's been around since 1983. Um, there are many, 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 many states that do it. There are also, locally, uh, the only state around here that doesn't is Vermont but there are different reciprocity rules with each of the states down the coast, which is where most of you know, the quote-unquote snowbirds go down and take up residence. I, I do want to uh, uh, piggyback on something that was alluded to here. Uh, 
there are many people who have places in multiple states. Uh, you can have multiple residences, but you have to be able to have only one domicile. That's the legal place of residence, which right. is fit into what Greg's discussion was moments ago. So that you have a place and you spend requisite amount of time in South Florida or in Arizona or in the Carolinas, uh, they have to be very clear, as the illegal documents should be very clear, as to what your primary residence is, otherwise known as your domicile. Because there's only one legal domicile, you can have multiple homes. But couldn't you have a person, I could see trouble coming if you have um, Mr. Jones who sells you a product and he's in Massachusetts, but he doesn't have the legal right to be selling a product for Florida. And your product that you've purchased may or may not include the same reciprocity in Florida. Typically, the, the broker's licensure does not come into play okay. when a person moves. The, the, <coughs> the insurance company that you'd use, you would want to check to make sure that they have. Yeah. The, but in most cases, 99.99% of the time, that is portable to wherever sta whatever state. Now, again, the, the qualification of that product as, as being part of the partnership program may not be because each state has their own little nuance as to what they consider a qualifying product. So you have to make sure that these things are cleared up in advance. Now, when we were talking um, on another show about um, assisted livings, they are something that you pay for 100% privately right. with your own funds. Mm -hmm. Does long-term care insurance come into play at all with assisted livings, or can can they? Yes, they do, and they most of them, <coughs> um, the vast, vast majority of them. And actually, if it, one of the things that stands across all states in their partnership qualifications is that it must not only provide for the assisted living, it also has to provide for home health care, right? And so you have the. the there's the three layers of long-term care. And you know, people want to be in their home as long as possible. And then the next step ideally would be then to go assisted living. And then if need be, into the nursing home. Private pay for the first two, home health care, long-term care, I mean the uh, assisted living. Long-term care does pay for those. The type of product that you decide to purchase for that, however, has different levels. In most cases, assisted living is 100%, but then people have choices as to how much they want to be reimbursed for home health care. And of course, you know, if you want 100%, well, it costs more. If you want less, it costs less. So, you know, it's, it's not rocket science on that side of it, but um, it, it, it does dovetail with everything. So if you get a nurse's aide who wants more than the, your long-term care insurance um, pays for, you would have to pay the in-between. Right. I was just telling Greg before he uh, <coughs> came on this morning, uh, of a client I had many years ago, it was one of the first clients I worked with. Very unassuming lady, but sharp, beyond imagination. She lived in a um, manufactured home community in the town of Plymouth. And she was very quick to show me everything that she had, one of which was a long-term care policy that she'd had for a number of years and had been paying pretty substantial premium on. And she pulls it out and she uh, hands it to me and I'm looking for the word rider or escalator and I can't find it. Effectively, at the end of the day, at the time we were having this conversation, the cost of a nursing home would have been somewhere around $250 a day out of private pay pocket. This long-term care policy that she'd already invested 12 or 13 years of paying was ceilinged, if there was such a word, at $80 a day. So she'd uh -huh. been paying for something that she didn't understand, sadly, and when I tried to explain to her that there was a shortfall of in this case $170 per day and it was going to add up to X numbers of thousands of dollars per month, she was absolutely non-believing. And I think the next day or the day after, that was the end of that policy. Mm -hmm. At that point she was 86 years old. But it's something that she thought she had locked up tidily and put away in a box saying that's one thing I don't have to worry about, only to have need for it. And as fate had it, she did in fact need some help at home. Uh, and at that time, she actually had stopped paying uh, the, the policy premium. All right. But she didn't get the benefit of the bargain she thought. All right. Well, she misunderstood. You got to know what you have. And, and that's, uh, it has to be reviewed. Even, uh, if you've purchased one, um, you don't, didn't know about this partnership program, and maybe you've had one from, from however many years ago, 
Um, did it have inflation protections? Because a lot of them do. And so they try to keep that, that monthly or that daily limit bumped up. And it may have a ceiling, it may not. Um, is it a lifetime benefit or is it a two-year benefit? There are a bunch of things that come into play on these. There are many, many, many moving parts. So if it's something you've had for some time or even something you're, you're considering for the first time, understand that there are a lot of things that need to be looked at. And you have to understand also that each one of those moving parts, there's a cost attached. Mm. All right. I mean, typically when I sit someone <coughs> down, I show them the moon. I show them everything and say, okay, now. Well, look what this cost, that line item. Is that important to you? Does it need to be adjusted, yes or no? And so you have to go through it line by line by line. And it's a little tedious, but it is something that um, it's boring until you need it. Well, and that's <laughs> the problem is half the time yeah. people don't look at it until they need it, and then they don't even know what's in there. Right. And by the time, like you yeah. said, that they do get to it, it may be something very different than what they thought they signed up for. Mm. Or it might have been great at the time. You know, but doesn't have had you know a ceiling and doesn't work for ten. And there may dollars. be a lesson here, just in the broadest possible sense. And again, Greg just alluded to it, because people have wills or powers of attorney or healthcare proxies today, their life will change in the next mm. three to five, ten years. And the younger these things are done, the more life will change. Little kids become adult children. So it's important and incumbent upon all of us uh, not to forget that these documents that we had and still have need to be looked at and the rule of thumb is every three years or so mm -hmm. or on the occasion of a very seminal event in life you know death of a child for example death of a trustee for example in a trust who do we replace people with if we still have the app the ability and the opportunity to do so but uh, things should be reviewed all the time life doesn't life is not static yeah people do have that tendency ah i've got this in the drawer it goes, in the safe box it goes, and that's it, you know? And then the bill comes or the not, and the, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just human nature, yeah. really is. Because who likes to talk about all this fun stuff and just sick guys like us that get involved in this world every, every day? But, it, you know, it is, uh, it's very, very important analogy, to not be complacent. The analogy we've used is it's like home insulation. Everybody needs it, <laughs> nobody sees it, nobody wants to pay for it because it's not a toy or a bauble. You'd rather have a brand new shiny car in the driveway but it's insulation. Now your heating bill goes down and your air conditioning is better in the summertime with insulation, but it really, do I want to pay for it? No, nah, I don't think so. I'd rather have the shiny car. This is the <laughs> rationale that I go through most times. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, in another show, we talked a little bit about trusts. How would um, trusts impact long-term care? If, you were, if you're talking about long-term care insurance, mm -hmm. those sound like they should dovetail. Um, in talking to the two, and you need to talk to people like yourselves and not mm -hmm. just one of you, I would assume. Right. Do you want to start? You go right <laughs> ahead. You're, you're the trust. Uh, no. <clears throat> trust is a box into which things are placed. Trusts own things. Therefore, things have to be titled in the trust. So whether or not Insurance products, in the broader sense, annuities. Uh, again, whatever the uh, whatever the item is, it's who owns the v who owns that particular thing that's put into the box. Think of a picture in a frame. You know, the picture gets painted any number of ways. The frame is the trust. Now, the manner, the type of trust that's utilized, uh, may vary. Whether as we spoke in an earlier program, whether that trust is revocable or whether it's irrevocable. Again, trusts are done for different purposes. Again, the, rule, the takeaway from this is not all trusts are alike. So when someone says, I have a trust, that's a wonderful thing if it does what that person wants it to do. If that box holds in it things that are done uh, for, the, for the reason which they were designed. I've had occasion a number of times to sit with people who have the trust but never have retitled the ownership of the product. So if their car was designed, if their trust was designed to own a car, for example, and that car was still owned by Mickey Mouse, that's kind of working across purposes. I've got something, I've got a box that has nothing in it because Mickey Mouse, the car, is still outside the box. And I don't suspect that it's much different how you title ownership. All right, and that's, that's an important piece that um, people don't necessarily understand. Um, long-term care, um, life insurance, um, annuities, things of the sort. 
there are usually multiple pieces to that puzzle, meaning, say, like long-term care, you have the person who is insured. All right, that's great. Sometimes they develop a death benefit inside them. Okay, so now you're going to have a beneficiary, right? Now, who, too, then, is going to own it? Then, who's going to be the payor? So you have these multiple parts and pieces that, again, not coordinating with the trust because what, is, what does long-term <coughs> care do? What does a trust do? Both are there to try to preserve assets and have things operate the way you want after a time where things are a little bit out of your direct control. Right? Long-term care, you're using that because you need something from other people and you, you're not used to that world. You're out of it. You have activities of daily living that you can no longer do. You can't bathe, you can't dress, you, you know, things like that. Well, that means that you are giving up some control to others, voluntarily or otherwise, usually involuntarily. So how do we make it so that we're now we've put instruments in place to protect people and their assets so that things happen the way they want after that? You have to have all these different people, could be usually at least two, that share these duties along with the trust that have three and get them all integrated so that they work together and not work against each other. So <clears throat> when you have a um, long-term care um, product, if you were, um, say, a 75 or 80-year-old and you have a, a product and it, you and your spouse and now your spouse passes away, does that have any kind of an impact um, does it change anything because of a, do they have their own um, policies? Are they policies that are together? Um, usually if a, a, a husband and wife uh, get a policy together, there's some kind of a premium discount that goes along with that. So it is common that if you have the two folks in the same house, you'll have it on one policy. Um, and it depends on the contracts. A lot of contracts offer uh, certain incentives to get you to choose them over another one. And one of those would be uh, a cessation of premiums, let's say, that after one spouse dies, then you don't have to pay anymore. Um, it could be that there's a, one needs the benefits, the other one doesn't, so then the premiums stop. So there's various features of all of these. And again, many companies offer them, and they are in competition. So you, know, you have mentioned in the past that you, know, you recommend people take at least three different views of things. Mm -hmm. That, this is one of those areas where it's critically important you look at the variety of things out there because it's not just traditional stuff. There's a lot of really oddball products out there now that um, are, are different than what people are used to, and they have a lot of different features and benefits that really do compete, so you want to get the best you can for the money. So if a person does become <clears throat> widowed, they should be looking at that as well. They usually just be look at wills mm -hmm. um, in our world. Yeah. but. Sometimes it could have an impact on an insurance as well, such as this. Oh, um, and it may be a policy they just have forgotten about because they didn't need it. Right. And maybe now they're going to need it, but the spouse is no longer there, and it was a policy with both of them. Yep. And, um, and it could be that, you know, maybe at that time even, uh, they've decided that it's time to get something because they see something coming down the road. Uh, and, they, and at that point where a spouse has passed away, oftentimes it's life insurance that comes into play. And so now they've got assets that they could potentially need to preserve. Again. So that's yeah. that. You know, it's sometimes you're thinking, "Well, geez, I'm 75 years old. What do I need it for now? I'm too too old. It'll be too expensive." Well, it very well may be that these large assets you just collected uh, need protecting, and uh, and there are ways to do it. This being one of them. I would also just add here again, in the, in the most uh, general of nature. Uh, as people, as we get older, we tend to become somewhat more intimidated dealing with people who are somewhat younger, who may have a different knowledge base than we've had. If we've worked as a carpenter all our life, to sit down and talk about long-term care insurance can be intimidating. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid if you're a consumer, because ultimately we are all consumers. To sit down, and again on recommendations, as Greg said in an earlier program, from friends, for example, sit down at no cost and talk eyeball to eyeball to people. Mm -hmm. Telephone calls don't work. Emails are wonderful, but they're impersonal. Don't be afraid to sit because the people that are going to be most needy if you need the pieces of a policy that you have are going to be the people that you've eyeballed to say, look, Greg, I need something. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to calling an impersonal phone number, talking to a different person every time. Don't be afraid to interview people because it is a still a very people business. 
no matter how much we try to avoid interaction. Well, and I tell people, too, that we do have the community center here for a reason, lots of different reasons, but um, it is a safe place, too. Some people don't want insurance people yes. or uh, mm -hmm. folks coming to their home. So, you know, we do have council rooms here and um, many places that people could meet and interview somebody to see if there's someone they want mm -hmm. to Absolutely. go forward and, and trust. Right. Um, the last thing I thought we would ask um, is about these hybrid products, mm -hmm. um, traditional products versus hybrid. What is a hybrid product? <laughs> well, you know, I, I get I get at least two or three calls a week asking me about these hybrids that someone found on the internet, and isn't this wonderful? And, and they come with all kinds of crazy names. So break it down very simply. Hybrid product is the combination of two different types of products into one. Um, one of the more common ones, uh, you'll, see, you'll see annuities and you'll also see life insurance combined with long-term care. The most common one being um, life insurance combined with long-term care. Now, how those work differently is instead of paying an annual premium, what you do is you pay a one-time lump. And so it's a, a more substantial amount yeah, of money yeah. that you put in. So maybe it's 100000 maybe it's a half a million, whatever it may be. There's very, very generous underwriting, meaning that you know, they're not going to be as strict as they would otherwise be on regular life insurance. Now, what is the advantage of that? Well, the advantage is that what you're doing is you're actually taking these two worlds and putting them together, and you're creating an asset that's much larger than the money that you have. You're not paying annual premiums. You're using your money to do something safe. An example would be, I uh, had a couple in, um, in Massachusetts, uh, both about 60 years old, uh, wanted to put in 150000 I think it was. Yeah, 150000 of of their own money into this particular hybrid product. So what it ultimately was is now becomes, what if they die? Everybody wants to know, what if I die? What happens to that money? Well, guess what? You just turned 150000 of taxable cash that you had in your pocket into 250000 of tax-free money to your beneficiary because life insurance pays off tax-free, right? income tax-free. But on the other side of it, what they created then was also a lifetime monthly benefit for the two of them of $11,150 a month forever. So if they need long-term care, if they need home health care, if they need assisted living, they now have this benefit and it'll never, they can never outlive it. Now, it won't adjust for inflation. It stays at its level that you purchase up front. But even at that level, it could be a significant offset if you're looking at the anywhere from you know, ten to $12,000 of average a nursing home cost. That's a significant thing. And the more significant than that is that it's something they can't outlive. So there's these very, very strange products. A lot of the traditional long-term care have limits as to how many years you can have. So it'll be a benefit, but it'll be limited to X number of years, four, five, yeah. six, seven. Um, so you could outlive that. That's not something that you really want at that age and stage. So th these hybrids are interesting. They're more expensive in the short run because it is that lump sum up front. Um, it's not for everybody. If and, and we use the example of that, you know, 75 or 80 year old person. Well, if they're in seriously ill health at that point, you know, as generous as the underwriting is, they're not going to get it. They're not going to get anything really at that point, right? So this is like anything, if you wait too long, you're just not going to be able to get it, right? So it's a very, very, very different type of approach to this particular thing. And I think it's important to note, though, that most of these hybrids do not qualify under the partnership program exemptions. Mm. So they're not partnership <coughs> policies. So the person then has to weigh, well, is that product going to be better for me in asset preservation over a long period of time versus a traditional one that would qualify and just simply exempt things? So that's where the amount of assets, how you're going to use them, where they're going to go, all of that comes into play as to figuring out which one of these is going to be the better for you to select. And your age, obviously, too, is going to have something to do with it. The older, mm -hmm. you know, if you started at a younger age, it certainly might be a little bit more advantageous. Right. And the, and the way that age relation works in a hybrid is, again, it's a, it's a fixed amount that you decide. So if it's 50 grand or 100 grand, whatever the case may be, 
it, that's not going to change based on your age. What will change is the amount of benefit that it, that purchases. Right. All right. Okay. So it has kind of a different way of adjusting for your age. So to um, to wrap things up, when you folks work together with um, clients, how does that picture look? If I came and said I I want to sit down and look at my financial picture, I guess. Um, I have a will, I have this, I have that, and I name three or four documents. I want to have them re-looked at because mm -hmm. they haven't been looked at in a number of years. Um, how do you dovetail or how do you work together? Well, on the review of documents, as we just talked about a few minutes ago, uh, that's an area where I would do two things. Look at what's here in front of me. If it doesn't need to be changed, you save clients money. If it does, on recommendation, need to be changed because it opens up the opportunity to change in a direction more consistent with their age and their current needs and their forecasted needs, um, this, these are the kinds of things that we would do. Oftentimes people come and they don't know enough to ask the questions, so you're helping them frame the questions that they should be asking. Have you ever thought about this, 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 and this? Not pushing them in a direction, but just nudging them to give consideration to some things. And at that point, if they say, yeah, we really should need to, then as I mentioned in an earlier program, the issue of being an independent person seeking the best possible result is where I would make the overture to Greg. Right. And, and in, from my perspective, always asking the question. And if, and if you're working with someone uh, that hasn't asked the question of, who is your attorney and can I get a hold of them and talk to them? Do I have your permission to do that? Now, and who is your accountant? And you have to have a team approach because if you go and you put all these different pieces and all these places and they don't talk to each other, they don't coordinate, it, backfire. it backfires and it backfires in a way that you're going to be harmed or like I said, even in the case of that, would you have a special needs grandchild or whatnot that you wanted to leave something to and you don't do it the right way. You have to have those questions. Even if you don't know the questions to ask, you've got to be making sure that you're being asked a lot of questions when you're doing these th different reviews. And I think the first step happens where that's the most difficult for most people, and that is going out, making that first step and saying, I need to review my stuff. And it, I mean, it, there have been times when uh, I remember someone came into my office once and said, you know, hey, I've got a couple of things. Can I uh, bring them by and, you know, just, I said, yeah, sure. And they came in with this big <laughs> bag, <Box. laughs> big bag, big giant shopping bag, just filled with paper. I mean, there were 27 different bank accounts. There were, th I mean, stuff all over the place. But they took that first step. And they said, you know what? This is something I really need to get organized. And once you do that, the rest should come pretty easy, so long as somebody's having that team approach when they're dealing with you. Well, I can't thank both of you enough for, um, being here, I think one of the things that we're going to do going forward is not only to have you come back, but I'd, I'd like to hear from folks at home what some of your mm -hmm. questions might be, because I think that might help us to frame what our next um, show will be. And lastly, we did start a, um, we're calling it our little black book, and mm -hmm. it's a black notebook with tabs that have different, your will and your this and your that documents, mm -hmm. so that when families come and after whoever has passed away, they have a place. You know, we have our file of life on the fridge mm -hmm. for medical things. We should have something for financial and not have it tucked away in a safe deposit box that nobody has a key to. So um, <laughs> yes. thank you both for being here. Thank you thank for you. tuning in. And we will be back again sometime soon.